it's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe today. Now, the Nigerian governors have agreed to ban movements between states for two weeks as part of efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19. Only essential services are going to be permitted. Now, the decision was taken at the sixth teleconference meeting of the Nigeria Governors Forum that held on Wednesday. The NGF chairman and also governor of Ekiti State, Dr. Kayode Fayemi, said the, necessary, the, the action, pardon me, became necessary because of the increasing evidence of community transmission of coronavirus. Now, in order to strengthen coordinated implementation of necessary public health recommendations across states, the governors also resolved to set up COVID-19 committees at the regional level, headed by their state commissioners of health. So... As you've already stated, Dr. Dr. Kaede Fayami is going to be joining us on the program today for us to discuss this in further detail, to find out more about the meeting that held yesterday and exactly what an interstate lockdown means. Is that a total nationwide lockdown? Those clarifications are necessary. Doctor. Well, I think when uh, Governor Fayami joins us, he will be able to offer necessary clarifications. But it is good to see that, you know, the governors have been meeting. This is their sixth uh, teleconference. So it's good to see them uh, observing social distancing, particularly as we have been told by yeah. the Minister of uh, Aviation, Adis Rika, that many of them had wanted to continue with their usual habit of going to Abuja, uh, either necessarily or ne unnecessarily. And he had had the cause, you know, to stop five governors from just flying up and down unnecessarily. Mm. So teleconferencing may perhaps be the way to go, even after COVID-19. Absolutely. But as to the uh, content of their teleconference yesterday, yes, the governors are proposing uh, interstate lockdown mm. for another 14 days, with the exception of essential services. Yes. Essential services in this regard will re refer to, I guess, supply of uh, petroleum products, uh, mm. pharmaceutical products, and uh, maybe food items because there's the supply chain between the north and the south has been disrupted. And I hope that after this, uh, governors in the south, southern part of Nigeria will begin to think, because they don't invest in agriculture. There is more activity in terms of agriculture in the north. If you ban interstate uh, movement between the north and the south, the, the south will not be able to feed itself. So as a country, we need ourselves. You know, there's uh, a ground for unity. Absolutely. So this is one of the fallouts, in my view. Now, the uh, Governors Forum yesterday also agreed on uh, regional committees. My concern is that, is this the establishment of another bureaucracy? State commissioners of health are supposed to meet on a regular basis, uh, maybe by teleconferencing or whatever, you know, but what is the purpose of that, uh, you know, uh, teleconference among commissioners of health? When every state, mm. and I didn't get that from the meeting that they held, yesterday, mm. needs to focus more on testing, mm. on establishment of uh, molecular laboratories, Absolutely. on uh, the establishment of uh, isolation centers, mm -hmm. on the expansion of uh, capacity yeah. in dealing with this uh, challenge, and then looking inwards to see how they can generate more revenue. Because as you have seen, with Brent crude uh, mm -hmm. falling below $20, uh, they may not get a lot of money from the federal government. So mm. every state has to become very creative and innovative. Uh, there wasn't enough sharing of ideas in that direction, in my view. Now, the third point, with regard to the meeting by the governors yesterday, is about a national strategy. Is there a national strategy in place, which the state governments and the federal government have bought into? And if there is a national strategy in place, the next question will be, why is there so much discordance in terms of what is being done in the various states. Yeah. I think there's not enough in terms of the sharing of knowledge, in terms of coordination. If the sixth teleconference that they had yesterday is an indication that there will now be uh, a lot more in terms of the sharing of knowledge and collaboration and the buy-in into a national strategy that we have not yet seen, uh, then, of course, that will be a little progress. But Kyle Defy, I mean, the governor of Ekiti State, will be on this program, yeah. as he has agreed, and we thank him for agreeing uh, to, to join us on this program this morning. Uh, he will be able to shed more light on it, as in his capacity as governor of Ekiti State, 
and in his yeah. capacity as chairman of the Governors Forum. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you brought up that point as well, Doctor, on testing and testing capacity, because I believe that yesterday at the meeting, Dr. Kayade Fayami also stated that Ekiti State itself had almost zero testing capacity. So it will be good to get more clarification from him today on solutions going forward, which is really what we want to see. Well, but you know, Ekiti State has mm, four, four cases. cases. Yeah. Two have been discharged, mm. one died. Yeah. So Ekiti State mm -hmm. has only one active case. Yeah. But as we have seen in Kano and elsewhere, that is not mm. enough reason to be complacent. Mm. But they're also looking at ways in which the private sector can come in with tuberculosis machines, I believe, that can be used for COVID-19 testing, hopefully. But we'll get all those clarifications. Now, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control have confirmed 91 new cases of COVID-19 in eight states and the federal capital territory. The agency announced the development via its Twitter handle on Wednesday night. A breakdown of the cases showed that 74 were recorded in Lagos State, five in Katsina State, four of the cases in Ogun, two each in Delta and Edo, and one each in Kwara, Oyo, FCT, and Adamawa. Also, three more deaths have occurred, raising the fatalities to 28, while those discharged remain at 197. As of 11.25 p.m. on April 22, 2020, 873 confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported. Now, doctor, I must say this is extremely worrying because the first thing that I did when I saw that we had an increase of 91 new cases was the maths. Now, if we look at it, we've done around 8,000 tests so far. And if 873 of those are confirmed, that means about 10% of those tested have tested positive for COVID-19. Take Ghana. Ghana have done 86,591 tests. And of that number, 1.52% have tested positive, just over 1,000 cases. So we have about 10% of those we are testing, testing positive. Ghana have about 1.52% of those they are testing, testing positive. This is a serious situation that we actually need to see because it shows that the more we test, the more cases we are going to find. And it shows that Nigeria is really, really deep in COVID-19 here. Well, Minister Enahiri, the Minister of uh, Health, pointed out that the numbers continue to rise because we have ramped up our, our testing capacity. Originally, our testing capacity was at a level of 200. The president announced 3,000. Uh, then later, uh, Chukwe Iwekazu of the uh, Center for Disease Control announced uh, 5,000. To date, Nigeria has only been able to test about 8,934 cases yeah. as at yesterday. Now, if you, if you do that in terms of our population, that's about 0.004%. And the sad news, of course, is that we are far behind at least about 20 countries in Africa. Yeah. So we have not done enough testing, so we don't know the actual figure. And what we should say is that we need to test more. Because if you look at the countries that have been able to uh, do much better, particularly the countries in Eastern Europe, Poland, Romania, you know, Belarus, uh, no, minus Belarus, Slovakia, Czech Republic, you know, they move faster because they did a lot of testing. And that's why the Eastern European countries have been able to do better than their richer Western European uh, countries. So we can't play games with testing. We and with regard to testing, the numbers that were announced yesterday, Kano did not feature there. Mm -hmm. And previously, we have been told that, in fact, uh, there was an issue with the uh, testing center in Kano. Now, one of the officials came forward and said that had been sorted out. But when the numbers were announced by 11.52 p.m. yesterday, Kano had no case. Mm -hmm. And we need to pay close attention to that. What exactly is happening in Kano? Yeah. Chikwe Iwekazu has already uh, visited Kano, but Kano, given its population, could become another explosion center. Mm -hmm. Lagos already has 504 cases, and it has the size of the population of Kano. Yeah. And I think that nobody should play uh, politics with us. Now, another development yesterday was that the governor of uh, Kad uh, uh, Kaduna State, mm -hmm. Nasir Rufai, announced that he had tested negative twice Good for COVID-19, and he was congratulated uh, by a lot of his fans on, uh, on uh, social media. So it's good to see him mm. recovering. But I was a bit disturbed that he went straight to work. Mm. That may be a polit political move, but maybe perhaps he needs, to, uh, he needs to still keep himself, 
you know, away from other people mm. who may have been uh, exposed. But it's very good news to hear that uh, he has recovered. Now, it's again disturbing that Geoffrey Onyama, the foreign affairs minister, says Nigeria lacks the capacity to bring people abroad who want to come home bring them home. But we've run out of time. Rhodes Maybe we'll have an opportunity. That, <laughs> that with us, which is actually good that you brought that up. Yeah. That's all on the news headlines. We'll take a short break now. And when we are back, uh, Rota Soderi will be here to give us updates on what we just brought up. So do stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Rotas Odiri, our business correspondent, joins us now. And like Dr. Rightfully said before the break, Jeffrey Onyema coming out to say that we lack the capacity to bring Nigerians home. Over to you. Good yes, morning. Yes, Dr. Rice, good morning, Leila. Uh, good morning. Yeah, so um, this is really a, it's a, it's a, um, a check on the aviation sector as far as you know, the way I saw it anyway. In that um, he said there weren't enough resources. Uh, this is being, it was being quoted by the cable uh, based on the most recent um, task COVID-19 task force briefing uh, that they've been giving on a very regular daily basis now uh, in Abuja. Uh, he said there weren't enough resources. Federal government didn't have enough resources to bring back every Nigerian that wants to come home. Mm. Uh, you know, and you were just talking about math now a few minutes ago with regards to the number of COVID-19 cases testing versus confirmed. So if you try to do the math with every single Nigerian that would want to come home, it, is it realistic to try to bring all of them back? So I kind of see yeah. where he was coming from from there. And I thought that perhaps the aviation sector can be called upon to assist with regards to domestic airlines. Um, they have made um, announcements in the past that um, domestic airlines can assist, for example, in repatriating Nigerians from uh, Dubai uh, or repatriating them from the UK and other, other um, nations. Um, the airports have been closed for the, you know, the, extended, the closure extended for another two weeks, um, but there have been flights that have been allowed to take place to bring um, folks back. Uh, there's a tweet from Air Peace where they were lamenting um, the extension of the lockdown and the fact that there's not going to be any more flying. That is a, a, a conversation about the challenges that the aviation sector has yeah. faced. Globally, um, the aviation sector is said to be lose, to have lost or projected to lose $150 billion. That was earlier in about February with regards to the shutdowns. Now it's been extended to about $350 billion. So it's doubled. So the counter argument to whether or not the um, aviation sector in Nigeria, that is domestic airlines, can assist in bringing every Nigerian home now becomes a case of the thin profit margins that they have, the cost of flights, um, you know, or flights in, 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 in and out, back and yeah. forth. Maintenance charges, if you want to maintain an aircraft, you have to do it overseas, and it costs, it's in dollars. We know that the dollar has moved as far as because, because of the foreign exchange. So the, the, the cost measures that are in place would be a challenge mm. for anyone who doesn't want to do this. But if we look at what happened with, um, and I know the Morning Show talked about this extensively, the uh, xenophobic attacks in South Africa. Airpeace, for example, was one of the airlines that stepped up and said they would bring back a number of Nigerians. But then that was just one destination in South Africa. That was within the continent. Now you're looking at where several. the most several, where the most populous African nation on the world. You can find Nigerians uh, in all in businesses all over. So there's two sides to the argument as to whether or not, and some people are saying with people I was talking to, well, it should be the government's responsibility to do this. Some said people should pay their own way to come back. You know, um, but he did say um, what um, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said was that look, the, what they're focusing on now was some students that were in uh, Sudan. He said that they are prioritizing those particular students because of the cost, and they want to bring them back. And unfortunately, they can't bring. That's the home. reason so that's why the, we have to it. put all of this in context. Mm. First, uh, mm. I would say, well, let's thank uh, Geoffrey Onyema for his honesty. Yeah. Because the statement that he made at the uh, presidential task, task force briefing yesterday, as far as I'm con concerned, it was a confessional statement mm. in terms of the handicaps that the uh, government is facing. But when I talk about context, when the Nigerian government, through the Federal Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and the Diaspora Commission, decided that Nigerians who wanted to come home will be allowed to come home. Two conditions were given. One, you must be able to pay for your flight. Mm. Two, you must uh, get uh, a COVID-19 certificate. And in London, we were told that persons were being tested in batches of 40. The first batch of 40 that was tested, 10 of them presented, you know, symptoms of COVID-19. That was the last that we had. Now, to have the Foreign Affairs Minister saying, that Nigeria does not have the financial capacity 
to bring people abroad who want to come home, uh, then that raises a question. Mm. So how do you align that with the earlier information that they will be required to pay for their own flight? So where is the cost part of it for the Nigerian government? He didn't make that clear. Two, he said that even in terms of facilities, Nigeria cannot afford to bring Nigerians abroad home. Now, what we know is that over 2,000 Nigerians, many of them stranded abroad, wanted to come back home. And according to him, Lagos, the facilities in Lagos cannot take more than an additional 200. And the facilities in the Federal Capital Territory cannot take more than an additional 200. In other words, so where does that leave all the stories that we have been uh, told? That capacity is being developed, a 100-bed isolation center is being developed, a 200-bed isolation center is being developed. The, the minister, the minister was telling us indirectly, and that's why I said we should thank him for his honesty, for his forthrightness, that Nigeria is not ready. Yeah. Nigeria is not prepared. Yeah. Now, the third leg of his statement, he said that the federal government is prioritizing a set of students who are in Khartoum, Sudan. Yes. Now, why the special focus on those students in Khartoum, Sudan? Why should they be the ones that the Nigerian government will look for resources by any means possible to bring home? How about right. Nigerian students in Dubai? How about Nigerian students in the United States? How about Nigerian students in the United Kingdom Doctor. who want to come home? So there should be no preferential treatment. And that's why I said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the minister was uh, forthright. Now, you talked about aviation. You linked all of this with aviation. In the United States, $25 billion has been provided under the CARES Act for the bailout of the aviation sector. And 10 airlines have been listed, you know, to be bailed out. Yes. And although the act says, as uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen, uh, Mnuchin. Steve uh, Mnuchin yes. uh, decides, you know, it's at the discretion of the Treasury uh, Secretary. And they are working on that now. Airports in the United States are also saying, not just airlines, Airports should also be protected because the aviation industry totally has been disrupted. Do we have a plan to bail out our airlines that you were recommending as people can come in as Father Christmas? Do we have any plans to bail out our airports? Well, 25 billion is our entire budget, so we have to put that in that context. That is actually what I was going to say. And I was actually going to say as well, yeah. if I am correct about the students in Khartoum, we also have to think about it. I read a report the other day that stated that Sudan as a country have four ventilators in the entire country. Mm. So if we want to talk about why, Resources I can are, actually kind of see why yeah, they would by, choose them yeah, first. There's no justification. How many ventilators do we have in Nigeria? We That's, have just 13 molecular laboratories in Nigeria. So, mm. so perhaps... Uh, you know, it's about yeah. explaining more to the people. No, certainly. Questions need to be answered. Rosas, thank you, and thank we you. will thank see you, you tomorrow. You, that is all on this segment of The Morning Show. When we are back, we will be giving you some COVID-19 updates with Aaron Akirajala. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Joining us now is Aaron Akirajala. With uh, COVID-19 COVID update, yeah, right? Not some, sports. No, not sports. Because the sports summer. industry has been yeah, shut so down. They've well, actually no, come to a grinding halt, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but let's actually give you some of the numbers that are actually coming in. And so far, so good. 2.6 million people and cases of the virus has been confirmed globally, with the total death toll standing at about 183,441 fatalities. And this is the tally being brought in by John Hopkins University. The United States still leads the number of cases per country, with just over 842,300 people infected with the virus. Western Europe follows suit with Spain, Italy, France, and the United Kingdom all continue to grow in the last 24 hours. But I'll bring you some COVID-19 updates. And let's tell you that Australia has actually called on the G20 nations to end wet life wild markets over concerns that they pose a threat to human health, a move which could further strain ties with China after the Canberra called for an international inquiry into the coronavirus pandemic. Well, Canberra, uh, one of several... Yeah. Well, representative comes right now from countries really and truly calling for inquiries into this. 
At the end of the day, Berlin have also called in. I believe the UK have called for inquiries. The US have called for inquiries. We're seeing it coming from several different yeah. countries. And to be honest with you, it's not, it's not a bad call at all. In fact, Germany have sent a £130 billion invoice over to Beijing for coronavirus damages because China must explain. Well, the problem, of course, is that we're getting different kinds of hypotheses yeah. about what uh, actually led to the coronavirus. There have been some studies, uh, and I'm quoting the Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal in a recent article, saying that perhaps when we say it's as a result of uh, uh, wet wildlife markets, uh, we may be, you know, looking in the wrong direction. Okay. But what I hope is that at the end of the day, research and analysis would reveal the eventual truth about coronavirus, and yeah. that's in relation uh, to you know, uh, how it originated, where it originated from, mm -hmm. and the nature of uh, the uh, disease itself. Mm -hmm. Now, as for the uh, seroprevalence around the world, in fact, the, the figures are even worse. Uh, you know, the, it's about, it's very close to, it's about 2.6 million, as you said, yeah. but the people who have died, there are already over 184,000 mm -hmm. as at yesterday evening, but 721,000 plus persons have recovered. Uh, but the active cases uh, in the world, maybe that means something. 97 percent are in the mild condition uh, cases. Three percent are actually serious or critical. But the uh, thing that I think we need to focus on is the point we tried to raise earlier about testing. Testing, testing, and testing. Yeah. Now, if you look at Europe, and you refer to Europe, the Eastern European countries seem to be doing better. And Slovakia seems to be doing best. Belarus seems to be doing worst in Eastern, yeah. Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all of them together, they are doing better than Western Europe. And that's because they did better testing. They took the initiative to lock down earlier. Africa has still not woken up. There is no African country that has done more than 1 percent of testing, in spite yeah. of the fact that we criticize Nigeria. Yeah. So we need to do much better in Africa. And Iceland tested their entire population. Aaron, thank you for Always today's COVID-19 updates, and we'll see you tomorrow. Much.